Thank you very much. Um, it's an absolute joy and a privilege to uh, be back in Cambridge and also to talk about probably one of my favorite topics. Um, so this uh, has a very special, I feel kind of like old and I feel very odd because um, so we were just, a friend and I uh, were just talking and so it turns out that I was here, arrived 15 years ago um, to do my graduate degree and my PhD was about making an argument, a philosophical argument for human right to health. And, and so it's really lovely to be asked to talk about human rights and health and, and also that um, I'm working now for a while at the Global Health Ethics Unit of the World Health Organization and that PhD that I wrote is something that the WHO is now using in its work. And so it just feels like all these really interesting things coming together. Um, so thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. So my um, talk, so are there any logistical issues? Can people hear me? Yes, you can hear me, everything's fine, all good. So if you can't hear me or if I um, am not being clear or anything like that, please let me know, I'd be happy to talk. I don't mind being interrupted, so it's perfectly fine. So the topic that I was asked to speak on is health and human rights, uh, generally, so it's a very broad topic. Um, but what I'd like to do is give you essentially a quick and dirty state of the art of what's happening in the literature and the field about uh, health and, and the right to health. And I'm going to focus particularly on the philosophical aspects of the human rights you are going to have lawyers coming soon who will tell you about the legal aspects. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, there will be lots of people who use the language of human rights. And I want to just sort of more uh, give you a very kind of deep dive into what's at stake in the actual concepts uh, and, the, and the philosophy of human rights. Does that sound OK? Anyone want to leave? <laughs> so, So let me, um, I'm just going to put my timer in on the timer that I talk so that I know what's happening. So we have um, 45 minutes left for any kind of questions necessary. So let me uh, get right to it. So um, what I want to start with is uh, a picture that, how many of you are medics in the room? Excellent. Um, and how many of you are in the, doing something else with health? So generally the health and stuff. So I'm going to start with something that you probably are familiar with or you should be familiar with um, or it will make sense to you rather than the philosophy of it, which is, let me see, great, this is working. So this is a, um, a slide that doesn't exist on the internet anymore. Uh, but it did, and it's a, a slide that was uh, created by the Institute of Health <coughs> Metrics in Seattle. Uh, and what it does is that at a certain point in time, it basically identified all the causes of mortality and morbidity on one slide. So this is a heat map where the heat, so when it's really red, that means that it's the leading cause and it goes lighter. So basically what you have, you probably can't read it, is on the left-hand side, you have a list of diseases, and on the right-hand side, you have a global column, but then you have different regions, and then you have sub-regions. And so what you have here in this particular column is a global ranking of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality combined. So normally life uh, years, life expectancy, or life sort of years lost, but also the life years that are lost to morbidity as well. So that's the aspect of DALIs. I don't know if, how many of you have heard of DALIs or not, but let's just assume that there's a number, this thing that measures not only the number of years lost to a particular disease, but you can also measure how much morbidity per year that you lose to that disease and you combine it. So the number one disease is uh, sort of the uh, heart disease as being a global thing, but as you as you go into different regions, you find that there is uh, different stuff. So this is fantastic from a, a global health policy point of view, because you get a map of exactly what's killing human beings and what's killing human beings prematurely in the disease that's caused, right? Um, and so this is what you want if you want to find out what to do, right? What's the problem in global health? 
the problem in global health is preventable morbidity and mortality. Here's a list of the rankings of what's sort of causing maybe the most in the world, and then it's also by region. So why do we need human rights? Like, what's the point of adding human rights to this fantastic picture where you've just given, you've, you've been given a map, essentially, of what's killing, you know, killing human beings prematurely? What's, what's human rights going to do for you? But this is all to the medics, right? This is all the people who are who are understand sort of causes of disease and interventions. Why do we care about human rights, and what will it do for this? Any answers? Yeah, So you think human rights give us equity, some sort of, try to, but like there's this, but there's this idea that human rights will give us some, some sort of framework so that you don't arbitrarily hit these sort of diseases or there should be a process or something. Oh, so, so, so prejudicial, like preferential treatment. And you think human rights is supposed to protect you or help you? Yeah, no, no, I'm, there's no right answer. I just sort of, I want to know what you think. Because this is, for lots of medics, this is sufficient, right? Yes. The idea that you can sort of change the consequences of those And you think human rights is going to is going to make that plausible or realize that? Or, okay. Anyone else? So a human rights approach would give you a sense that health is not just a disease, that there, there's something else about health. And you think that a human rights system would, would give you that. So you think that the, something about the language, the concepts, the mechanisms, the instruments of human rights is going to help you sort of redistribute yeah. the disease or the resources? Okay. So it's funny you say that. So this is, has anyone seen this before? So this is a graph uh, produced by the same institution which is, um, which is that it tracks the funding for development assistance for health, it's called. So basically, when countries give funding through a variety of resources to address health issues in other countries, particularly developing countries, and what you see is that in 1990, the amount of money that's been going to development assistance for health was $7 billion, but over the period of uh, 15, 20 years, that has increased proportionally, like significantly, right? So the one of the reasons why you're hearing about global health all the time is that there's just more money in global health, right? 
And so there's a lot more money for research, there's a lot more resources that are going in. So you have significantly more resources that are going in. What you also see is that the, the, you'll see different players coming in. So what you see here is the Gates Foundation, which is essentially, as time goes on, is substantially increasing the money that's going into domestic health. And then different countries, so this is the United States, uh, is actually flattening out over time, and we don't know what's happening more recently. But what's really important is that your argument that human rights will increase the resources, you kind of don't need it because it's already happened, right? So you have a map of all the diseases and the premature causes of premature mortality and morbidity in the world, and then you have a multiple sort of increase, a factor in, in terms of the amount of resources. So why do we need human rights? Yes. Um, human rights may also influence uh, how much of a place people are in all social conditions. So things like access to education um, or women's rights are correlated with obesity rates. So now we move to the determinants. So you think that the human rights will do the work of addressing the determinants of disease rather than providing the care for the disease that this money is providing, okay? Anyone else? Um, you also So there's so many aspirations that human rights is going to solve all of these, right? It's going to do all of this work for you. Um, but it's interesting, right? So what is it that's going to, what is it that we want human rights to do? What do we think it does? Why do we think that it, it does this problem? So I want to talk about something that you may um, not have seen so far when you're interested in global health. How much, um, I'm sorry about the slides, I should have prepared better, but what this is, is that this is a graph from the Spirit Level book. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a, it's a very uh, sort of popular book that was written by uh, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson. And next week, um, so Marmot and Wilkinson are colleagues that have essentially defined this field. And what this graph is showing is that um, the greater the income inequality in a society, and so these are all developed countries, right? So that was, sorry, the preface of this slide is that we're now talking about developed countries. And so the greater the income inequality in a society, the worse the health inequalities, as well as the health of the entire population is worse, right? And so not just health problems, it turns out that all these other kinds of social problems are bad as well. So violence, teenage pregnancy, drug use, etc. So there's this correlation between income inequality and social problems, including health, right? So Wilkinson would argue, and some people would argue, that it's not the human rights that's the problem, it's the income inequality, right? So why do we need human rights? Fear. Yes, friendly. I mean, you talked about how you said such laws are going to protect us, but the only problem for the young white people is the years they don't have the right to have the same sort of thing, and it's a big scale of countries around the world to create that under the basis of the fact that there is a lot of human rights that they say don't need to be human rights. That's why it's wrong. How, how likely do you think that's going to happen? So then, what, why did you just give me this argument? <laughs> yeah, no, but that's the idea, right? Is that somehow human rights can be a powerful rhetorical tool in order to move countries to do or not do certain kinds of things. And perhaps we can use human rights to, um, you know, USA, Portugal, UK, New Zealand, these are the most sort of poorly performing in terms of health outcomes, but also tend to be in inequality. So there is, I mean, these are, these are really, uh, sorry, was there 
There was somebody else. Yes. So next week, I want you to ask Sir Michael Long, what do you think about human rights? <laughs> Let's see what he says. Yeah. Um, but you know, but there's this thing of like, what what is like? He's basically like, what is human rights going to do? It's the it's the stuff, right? Not the rights. Um, so what I want to argue, and what I want to show is that um, concepts matter a lot, right? So these. All this work that you want the human rights to do, uh, there's a real question about whether it can do all of that, whether human rights, the right to health, or human rights in general, or human rights law, whether it can do all of the things that you want them to do. Equity, fairness, distribution, redistribution, framework, determinants, you know, risk, rhetoric, advocacy, all of this stuff that you want human rights to do. Can it do it? Is it supposed to do it? What? Why is it that uh, people expect to do it? But most importantly for me, uh, it really starts with this idea that it's not the money that's the problem, it's the ideas that's the problem. It's more the poor ideas that I think is actually one of the more profound issues in global health, rather than the lack of money or the lack of technical solutions. It's actually the reasoning, and particularly reasonings about claims and rights and duties, and what is it that people have a claim to or not. And so basically my argument at, at the end of this, and if you can walk away from this, the only thing I want you to walk away from is I need to think harder. Like that's all, that's the only thing that, you know, I would be grateful if you walked away from this. Uh, but, so <clears throat> the second thing is that I really do think that whether you are medics or non-medics, that addressing health requires us to think in multidisciplinary and multi-professional ways. So it's one of those questions about, you know, everything looks like a nail if you have a hammer, right? So it's the same thing in terms of the way that we approach health, is that most people who are trained in medicine think that health is about illness and curing of healthcare. But if you're an economist, people think it's all about money, right? So it's all about getting access and how do we you know, sort of maximally distribute the uh, sort of uh, resources in order to uh, provide as many people access or have as many uh, uh, sort of uh, cost-effective results as possible. Um, and what I think is that uh, a more fundamental thing for me is that we actually are not clear as to what every human being's claim is in relation to their health. Right? So if you just think about it, it's like, what can a citizen in the UK expect from their fellow citizens and their government regarding their health? And I think that's the, the, the first answer, and the politician will say, well, we have the NHS. Everybody gets the NHS and access to the NHS. And that, to me, is not a sufficient uh, answer, because the NHS provides you care when you're sick. That's one part of the story. And this really story really begins, for me, in the AIDS epidemic. So when I was your age and I was living in New York and, and AIDS was sort of spreading rapidly and I was sort of doing community work with lots of my colleagues, particularly in the South Asian uh, immigrant community, particularly amongst taxi drivers, for example. Right? So one of the most important things that we learned when we didn't have uh, a vaccine or you know, we didn't have any sort of treatment the idea was that it wasn't a thing that was going to solve this. It was actually the idea of information and getting people the ability to control their body and behavior. And it's phenomenal. And still today, I can't believe so many people have difficulty actually having control over their own body and behavior. Right? It's, it's amazing to me, especially when it comes to, say, intimate relations. Right? The amount of different kinds of sexual practices people do or engage in without being in full control of what they're doing, right? And so, and then when your life is at risk or something like that, then it becomes a really, you know, sort of intense issue of like, how do we get people uh, to have that control over their body and behavior, not in one day, but th throughout their entire life course, right? 
that's what you need in order to protect yourself from an infectious disease like HIV, or whether it is sort of when I was a graduate student here, we were all worried about the avian flu, right? So we thought that we were going to play close the gates and what we're going to do and how we're going to survive. Now we have Ebola, right? So it's about that sort of over the lifetime, how do you give people control of their body and behavior? How does the social environment support that? And how does this idea of what of a claim or a right that every citizen has in that kind of uh, kind of environment? And so it really starts with, with, for me, my own personal interest in this is that I was working at Human Rights Watch and my uh, research was on trying to document the human rights abuses that people in India were suffering as a result of HIV AIDS policies. So things like mandatory or forced <coughs> testing of sex workers, isolation of people identified as being HIV positive, uh, arbitrary detention of people who are HIV or discrimination in the hospitals and trying to document those kinds of abuses. And what's interesting is that, I, um, so I was in the elevator and uh, the head of Human Rights Watch, who is a lawyer, was also in the elevator and said, so what do you do? And I said, well, you know, I work on uh, sort of HIV AIDS and human rights and the human rights in health. And he said very nicely, he said, you know, but we don't, we don't really think that there is a human rights in health. So I said, well, what do you mean? So they said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you, I'll send you something to read. So he gave me uh, an essay, which is very famous and still today, called The Two Concepts of Liberty by Isaiah Berlin. How many of you read that? One. Can you explain? Okay. So <clears throat> here's, here's how, how it goes. So basically, Isaiah Berlin, who... Um, was living, uh, so this is a very famous uh, lecture given at Oxford. Uh, it's a very short piece that you should all read at some point. And basically he says, you know, freedom comes in two ways, right? So one is that you have freedom when people leave you alone to do what you want to do. And let's call that negative freedom, right? So people essentially, you have this sort of barrier around you, and that's one kind of liberty, let's call that negative. And then there's a second kind of liberty or freedom, which is the positive kind, which is that you're able to do something, right? So you're able to be what you want to be, you're able to move around, you're able to learn what you want to do, you're able to do all that stuff. And he basically argued that if, if freedom comes in these two kinds of ways, governments should be focused on the negative kind, leaving citizens to live the kind of life that they want. They should not be doing positive freedom, because essentially, if that is the case, then governments and societies are making certain kinds of people, right? So if you are essentially sort of saying, we're going to help you do this, and we're going to help you do that, but we're also not going to help you do this, and not going to help you do that, that in a sense is essentially making human beings of a certain kind, and this is against a variety of different kinds of principles. What I'm interested in is actually the pre-legal Bit, where before something becomes a law, what is the concept or the idea that say, this is so important that we want to make it into a law, that we want to put it into a law? Now the question is, where does that idea come from? Right? So how do you come up with that idea? What is that argument that, that you're going to make? And that's the, the role of moral or political philosophy that gives you that concept and argument that you then say, okay, we need to now make this into a law. And, and many of our social uh, sort of conflicts at present are about different people disagreeing about that pre-legal concept. And when we try to push it into law, then you have very much like in the US, these fights over actually who gets to sit on the courts to arbitrate, because we're, we're fighting about that process of whether something's going into law or not. And if it does, how do we bring it back? how you push it forward. The second thing that's really important to recognize between the difference between a legal and a moral right is that there are some moral rights that will never be put into law, right? So one of them is a right to a just revolution, right? Very few countries will put that into a law. I think there's one or two. But we all know that you have some sort of moral claim that if you are living in an unjust society, that you must 
You have a right to fight that kind of injustice. Um, and the second is also the opposite, is also true, which is that you could have a completely unjust system that's perfectly legal, right? So think about apartheid in South Africa, which is that it's a completely legal system. And so you can still have a profoundly unjust thing. So you need to have something outside of the law that allows you to then critique what's going on within the law or outside of it. But also beyond that, when we have conflict of rights, when we have conflict of laws, when we want to make sense of different kinds of competing approaches, we need to go beyond the law in order to be able to make this uh, argument. So far, so good? All right. So I want to now just focus specifically on the human right to health, as opposed to just looking at human rights in general, or the laws and the moral rights that we're talking about. So the human right to health is interesting because it's one of the earliest and first uh, international rights that are recognized in international law. So the WHO precedes the United Nations system, and the foundation uh, sort of document of the WHO talks about the human right to health. And what's interesting about it is that the way that they described it is they said the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. And I kid you not, I still don't understand what it means. And I think I, I really don't understand what the highest standard of health means. Uh, you, you know, what do they think? What do they mean? And, and I'm still trying to figure that out. But I know that what they were saying is that it's not healthcare because they weren't foolish people. They knew what they were talking about. And they knew that it wasn't health outcomes, right? So they were talking about something about the highest standard of health, but I still don't know precisely what they were what they were talking about. So a second place that this right to health appears is the covenant on economic and social rights, as I was telling you about. And it has Article 12 in that. And so it sort of gives you very specific uh, claims, or it gives individuals, human beings, specific claims uh, about their health. And so one is that uh, you know every country must reduce stillbirth rate and infant mortality and health development. It has to improve the environment. It has to sort of address the prevention and treatment control of diseases. So we have this very um, disease-centered. And, and very much a public health services, goods and services approach. And so we're talking about 1966. And, and that's actually the claims that they're making. But in 2019, you all know that it's not just the healthcare, and it's not just water and sanitation, right? It's actually so much more that determines our health, illness, and disease. So how do we reconcile this now, which is that this is what the international law says in the covenant, uh, but we have our empirical research and our understanding of health and the determinants and inequalities at a different place. So one of the interesting places that this came to the fore is around the 1990s, where this idea of human rights and health as being related, as being profoundly central and integral and this goes back to my earlier question of why rights? What, what is rights going to do for us? Once we know what the diseases are, and once we have the money, why do we need the rights bit, right? And so it's a framework that a man called Jonathan Mann came up with, uh, and he was important because he essentially sort of brought the world attention to the fact that there was an AIDS epidemic. He was at the WHO for a number of years saying, this is really important, we really need to pay attention, and then the WHO wasn't paying attention to him because they had other agendas, because the WHO moves very slowly. And, and so he left and actually joined Harvard and set up a, a new center called the Health and Human Rights Center. And this framework that he argued was that it's very simple, which is that um, the violation, the public health programs, so if you look at the way that HIV AIDS prevention and control policies were implemented in the 1990s, it was very clear that they were abusive, right? So they arbitrarily uh, detained people, they forcibly tested people. This was actually having the negative result 
that if you were vulnerable, you were actually not going to be identified and you didn't want to go into testing and you didn't want to be identified as being one of the vulnerable groups. And so when public health, you know, you think that you're doing a good job because, you know, epidemiology tells you contain and control, right? Identify the cases, isolate the cases, and then you put a ring around it, right? But if you do that during an epidemic like HIV AIDS, what people are going to do and what people are doing in Ebola epidemics is that they run away, they hide. And so man was basically saying, so look, this is one of these things about human rights is that public health policies can be abusive, unnecessarily so, right? The second thing that he was arguing is that violations of human rights can have poor health outcomes. So when you restrict the freedom of access to information, this will impact health, particularly, say, in the AIDS epidemic, when you restrict access on sexual education, you're going to have an impact on health by sort of people becoming infected because they actually don't know how it gets transmitted. And that's what was happening in many countries is that as <coughs> campaigns were trying to spread information, governments would shut down these information campaigns because they were considered indecent. And so he was arguing that not only this, if you're not allowing certain groups to organize, so women sex workers collectives, right? So if you actually make that against the law, that's gonna have a health impact. So you have public health policies that violate human rights, you have violation of human rights that are going to have uh, bad health outcomes. And so the real choice here, he argues, and this is the hypothesis, is that societies which actually protect and fulfill human rights will actually have better health, right? So it's actually, if you respect what we consider to be human rights, then you're actually gonna have better health, health outcomes, which both the public health person wants and the human rights advocate wants. And so what we need to do is protect those, uh, those human rights. Now, the problem is that in 1996, 1997, when he put these frameworks, the philosophers of Harvard, the great and the good of the world, all came together, and they said, you know, it's a really great idea, but this thing called human rights are really unjustifiable, right? Where did they come from? You know, a bunch of people sat around the table and said, you know, I think a right to food would be a really good one. How about you? What do you think? Like, oh, well, you know, a right to education would be a really good one. You know, a right to vacations is a really good one. But these are really important because if you work all the time, somebody says, you know, human beings need to stop working once in a while, so they need to have a right to a vacation. So the philosopher said, you know, where is the theory for this? Where is the framework for all these lists of human rights? So, you know, without a theory, without a framework, without telling us which is more important than the other, these are all just essentially a list of things that you think are really good for people to have. And so, really, we need a theory of human rights. And without that, this sort of whole thing is basically based on law or rhetoric or something else, right? And so that is really, I think, one of the most important and defining movements where essentially the health and human rights movement kind of went more on a legal side. So you will see a lot of the literature from the 1990s onwards from more of a legal perspective talking about this is what the law says, and as a result, this is what must happen, or this is what's been violated as well, rather than a more of a robust philosophical reasoning about what, you know, what is all this work that we want human rights to do, and what can it do, and whether it cannot do or not. So one of the big things that happened in the right to health and human right to health field is that in 2000, there was something called General Comment 14. Anyone ever heard of this? So the, the Committee on Economic and Social Rights, which monitors the covenant on economic and social rights, um, developed a document that basically fleshed out what the human right to health entails. So this has essentially become kind of the, um, you know, the seminal piece of, of legal framework that says General Common 14 tells all world governments what the right to health entails. And these are your duties as a government 
and what you must do for your people regarding their health. So I won't go into it, um, but what it does is that it essentially brings a lot of these different kinds of ideas together. It is a right to health care. It is a right to prevention of epidemics. It is freedoms of association and information. It is access to different kinds of public health goods and services. And so I, when I first read it, didn't understand how it all holds together. <coughs> From a philosophical point of view, I want a nice starting presumption, and I want sort of an argument, and I want to see reasons why they build up, and then I want to see it going all the way forward. This didn't look like that to me. And I didn't understand why, and what, how does it make sense, and how do you defend it, right? So as opposed to saying, this is what international law is, and General Conflict 14 is some sort of kind of international law, because it comes from the UN system, it comes from the committee. What I was more curious about is that, how can I, you know, how can I explain it to someone? How do I know, how can I justify it? When somebody says, this is rubbish, how am I gonna be able to defend it by saying that this is the law, right? That's what you need, you need to be able to say, well, it's not just the law, here's the coherence, here's the reasoning behind it. But the reason it is the way it is, and which I now have great respect for it, is that a particular individual who was on the committee and his legal students basically went through all the reporting that countries had done in front of the committee regarding their, having their duties and obligations regarding the right to health and pulled it all together into a document. So what he didn't want is that some country to say these are all aspirational claims. What he can say is that actually these are all things that countries have reported to us as things that they have done as a result of uh, sort of respecting their right to health in their country. And so this is essentially a doable, uh, doable uh, sort of piece of uh, sort of framework that you want to do. But that doesn't give us what we are looking for when we want to do more of the rigorous reasoning. So you can go through the General Comment 14 approach where you say this is what General Comment 14 says and so therefore this is what every country must do. But if you're looking for more of the reasoning, like I said, that we need, we need to be able to explain to people around the world what is a right to health, where does it come from, why is it important, instead of saying this is what the law says, what we need to know is that we need to be able to explain what's the sort of debates that are going on. So you've got the negative freedom and the positive freedom and how do we bring these two together. We have to be able to have a theory of human rights that brings us a sort of a sense of why do we believe in human rights, where do they come from, how do we justify it. And in public health, we have this other tension, which is that we often use the word human rights when it comes to a minority, right? So we tend to sort of say, this group of people are either being neglected and they need to be given attention, or when public health policies are you being used or being implemented in the name of the greater population's good, we sort of say, oh, but what about the rights of those few people who are going to be hurt as a result of this? So, for example, we isolate the few people for the greater good of the many, right? And the people's rights are being violated, and so we have this tension about how the, the concept of rights seem to be actually sort of going against this public health approach that we need to figure out. But where are also um, these questions about you know, the sources of the rights that we want people to have, including the right to health. But also, this is more going into philosophy, and I don't know how many of you are philosophers here, is that we actually don't know what we mean by the concept of a right, right? So it's sort of this idea that we basically have this sense that when I say I have a right, it means that I have a right to something. Right? And we think, oh, this is easy. I have a right to be free, or I have a right to this piece of candy, or I have a right to this land that I bought. But it turns out that rights can also have lots of other kinds of stuff. You have a right to be left alone. You have a right to do something or not to do something. Right? So it's also a privilege of some kind. So it turns out that when we actually start thinking about the language of rights and the concept of rights, it's not that simple one, I have a right to something. And so how do we then reconcile these sort of philosophical parts about the definition of rights with our concern for 
human rights and specifically around health. When you want the right to health or human right to health to do lots of things for you, it's going to be at this level that you're going to have to solve the problem, right? You're going to have to be able to say, how does you know, the concept of a right address inequality? Or how does the concept of a right is going to protect people from sort of interference? How is it going to get our concept of right going to give them something as opposed to being left alone? And so one of the more obvious places to start uh, with sort of to try to get a theory of rights is what we call theories of justice. And so this was uh, uh, sort of very much what we're doing now, and this was very much an important over the last 10 years. And Cambridge and these buildings and this last thing was very important because a number of us have been working on developing different theories of justice that will then give us rights. So the idea is that if you can come up with a good society or come up with a picture of a good society, what you agree on as being important for every individual to have then becomes a right. right? So then that becomes your human right. And so the concept of human rights is, if you can think of, of a good global society, then what you think of as being important for every individual to have on a global level are then human rights. And there are great debates, there are continuing debates, and it tends to be that these are essentially some sort of schools, right? So which school are you from, and which school are you from, and who's your supervisor, and who's your supervisor? And, and so we tend to be in these kinds of debates amongst each other about which of one of these theories is more coherent, more justifiable, which rights come out of this one, which rights come out of that one. Some don't even have rights at all, right? And how do we disagree on this? And so that's where we are today, is that we are at the point of acknowledging that there's something called human rights, and you get there from a variety of different theories. And some of these people argue that it's health, and a right to health looks at in different ways. So what's happening now, and so as I come to the conclusion, is that there are uh, currently some very frontier issues, like I was saying, is that we've got a sense of how these different theories of justice give us rights, and human rights, or a right to health. But now we have these problems that we are trying to solve, that we, we're sort of working on. So <clears throat> what happened in the 1990s if you actually look at it, if you're interested in health, is that 90s was a huge sort of decade of human rights. And this is really important because of lots of political reasons. Something important happened in 1989. Anyone take a guess? Yeah, so the fall of both the Berlin Wall and the USR, which meant... <laughs> democracy. <laughs> So the idea was that after 1989, it was democracy is going to has won, and there's going to be global democracy, and as a result, human rights are going to be, you know, free markets, human rights, and, and sort of uh, sort of global justice is going to happen. And so it also happened in the 1990s. There was a great number of international conferences. There was the Vienna Conference on Human Rights. There was a global conference on women. There was the International Conference on Population Development. There are so many. All of them were talking about human rights. Everybody needs to have these rights and should have these rights and have these rights and how do we reconcile that? And then in philosophy, there was a great move towards this idea of global justice, right? So globalization had sort of started to reach its sort of visibility, everybody understood it. There were the anti-globalization movements, there were also the pro-globalization movements, but then there was also this question of now we're a global society, we can't deny that we're all interrelated, and therefore we need to start thinking about equality and justice and how. Uh, rights come into play. And there's a particular brand of philosophy called cosmopolitanism, which sort of a radical view that everybody is equal in the world, everybody has the same rights, and we should think about political borders as being arbitrary, and therefore uh, we should sort of start sort of moving towards that. What's happened is that uh, something profoundly fascinating happened in 2016. What happened in 2016? <laughs> and? And? 
So lots of things happened in 2016. <laughs> but those are the two biggest things that happened in 2016. But there's also Hindu fundamentalist one in India, largest democracy in the world. Brexit happened, which started essentially withdrawing and questioning the European Union. The far right almost won in the Netherlands. Italy, France are also unstable. US, Trump wins. So what we thought of in global health, that sort of move of money towards development assistance for health, this idea that global health is all about cooperation, it's all about sort of our common interests, has suddenly now completely broken down. Right? So everybody's moving back into national territories. The idea of multilateralism has been questioned. And so essentially global justice and cosmopolitanism are no longer assumed to be the logical next phase of our world. So now the question is, where are human rights, right? What's going to happen to human rights? What's going to happen to the human right to health? And this is what's so interesting for me, being at the WHO right now, is to see what does the WHO look like, given this breakdown of multilateralism, given this lack of sort of governments are no longer willing at to sort of incorporate sort of mutual exchange. They want to know, what's my national interest? How do we keep that threat over there? What's, the, what's happening to my money? How much impact can I have? Show me the results of what my donation is going to be. So now the question is rights. Where is the rights bit? Right? So there's so much about potential that we have about rights being able to explain things, the rights being able to bring sort of a new kind of understanding about equality in the world that's all suddenly being pulled away and now we have to think about how do we build, you know, how do we build the future and how do we bring rights back and what's the way that we should conceptualize rights, continue to conceptualize rights so that it makes sense, we don't keep telling it's because it's the law, but actually to be able to explain to people, to each other around the world, why rights are important, what rights are, and what the right to health does. And it's not just about healthcare, right? And it's not just about public health goods and services, but it's also about the conditions that help us be healthy. So I'm not going to sell you uh, my argument. So if you are interested, this is my argument, this idea that social justice is about a society in which individuals have the capabilities to live a, a good life, to be and do what they have reason to value. Um, and there are lots of different kinds of philosophical issues that I'm interested in working on. Here are the further resources, and here's the book that you can get. All right, so thank you very much for the uh, opportunity, and, and I'd be happy to uh, take any questions or any statements or any other kinds of provocations that you might have had. Yes? to um, rights to health, or is that just a separate objective issue? Say that again. <laughs> um, so with political human rights, we often talk about objectivity. What, do, what does that mean? So do the human rights that were obviously written in 1958 by some Western countries, can they now um, be said to govern the entire world? Is it relevant? And also what's to say that they're correct, because obviously they were written at a certain time by a certain group of men, probably. Do you think that is an issue which we need to consider when we are trying to create rights to health? Or is health, does health supersede that? Is it just objective and everyone should have a right to it? Okay. So, um, so this is my off-the-cuff remark and not a considered and detailed answer to that. I think the, your critique that the people who wrote human rights law in the 1950s and 1960s are not fully representative of the global population today. I think that's one sort of very clear view. Um, and the, the question that you're asking is, you know, did, did those people have the right view um, of what was needed then, and did they have the right view of what's needed now? And I think that the, the question is not necessarily just for those people who wrote human rights law, but we could say that to anybody who wrote laws in any country, particularly our basic constitution. 
So the question is, you know, do we have, you know, what are our resources to be able to either critique what was gone before? And my way of doing political philosophy is, is a way to engage with that and to be able to say, this is what they had in mind. This part was right, but these parts were not right. Yeah. And so that's how I engage with it. You might engage with it in a different way. You might take cases to court and say, that was a misunderstanding. This is the right way to understand it or something like that. So I don't think health is objective. I don't think the right to health is an objective. Here's the five things that a right to health has. And that's the way that we should apply it. I think um, the right to health should be uh, sort of generally similar around the world, but it's not the exact same thing. So the health issues for a woman are not the same as the health issues for a man or a child. And so they're not objective in that sense. They are relative to where you are in the life course and they're, you know, relative. And they also impact where you are in the world because the environment affects your health. And so you have to be able to think about the right to health in relation to the social and political environment. So that kind of finessing about what the right to health means in a particular location to a particular group, I think requires a non-objective approach. I think it requires a, a particular kind of reason. Does that? Somebody needs to pick the question. So yeah, in the back, you didn't say anything. Good. the right to health and human rights is culturally relative or relative to what point you are in life, is it then practical or productive for us to base a framework of global health on a human right that is culturally relative? If we can't all agree on what it looks like, how are we using this as the premise for us to base huge things like public health for the entire world? Yeah, so I think that there's, um I'm going to be a philosopher, lecturer, and sort of say there's actually two questions in what you just said. <laughs> so there's there's relative to the life course, and then there's cultural relativity. Those are two different things. And so so the thing that I'm working right working on right now is what claims can older people make regarding their health? Yeah, and it's a fascinating project for me because most societies essentially dismiss the claims of older people, thinking that their, um, their poor health is a natural event, or that um, they've had their fair chances and we need to focus on the young, right? And so there's, I think, something not right in that, and so we can actually see something like that. So what standard do we use to uh, consider the claims that older people have regarding their health? Uh, and so I think that there's something to be said for uh, ensuring a multi-dimensional quality of life, right? And I think we want that for everybody throughout the life course, which is that they want, we want people to be able to do what they have reason to value in their life. And it might be sort of a few basic domains or something like that. So that can be carried out throughout the life. And so I think you're right in being able to say, how does this work? How do we think about how to help over the life course? And so many of you are going to be able to make this your judgment about like where you are on the life course and what does that mean and how do you decide, decide whether someone is sort of not healthy or healthy or something like that. So that's something that has to come from basic science, but it also has to come from our understanding of you know a particular location and what's considered to be healthy and what's not, and also thinking about sort of what I hope you're going to listen and take away from you today. So this idea of well, we shouldn't necessarily think that what's natural isn't necessarily true and we should think about it in a kind of way. The cultural relativity bit is a much more complicated one. Um, so, for example, um, <clears throat> so, yeah, this might come off as really bad. So, <clears throat> so, the women in the Middle East have a vitamin D deficiency. Right? Um, and so the question is, how do we how do we deal with this? Because it's not like there's not sun, right? And it's because they're indoors a lot uh, and they're not allowed to be outdoors or they're not allowed to get enough uh, sort of exposure to the sun in order to be able to get stuff. So um, it's, a, it's a question that there's, a, uh, there's an objective sense 
that you have that this uh, this human being requires certain kinds of inputs, minerals, you know, sort of exploited in order to be healthy. But this culture says that uh, not only the practice leads to poor health, but sometimes the poor health outcome is actually considered to be valuable, right? So we can think of lots of different kinds of examples. And so how do you address that? And to me, that's the, that's the work where sort of when you think about uh, sort of feminism, cult, like universal values, human rights, we need to start thinking about is there some sort of basic uh, threshold that we consider all human beings to be able to live up to and how do we argue for some sort of uh, minimal threshold of human well-being that everyone should have irrespective of which culture they come from or which practice they come from. But, uh, but we, I can assure you that somebody will come up with a very difficult case where they'll say, but what do you think about this? I, I don't know. But, but that, that's how I would initially start to think about those two things. Do you agree about what I said about the life course versus the culture as being two different? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, just in that answer to your question, um, I didn't understand what you meant when you said about the poor health, poor health outcomes could be considered valuable. Um, like what would be an example of that? Um, can someone else watch? Can someone give me an example of a poor health outcome that's considered valuable? Um, stop spending time alone, like I'm getting sick and stuff like that because the doctors are not going to do that. Yeah. And? Yeah. Yeah. And? Race fears. <laughs> and? <laughs> Selective avoidance. Well, I mean, basically, more like we're being big and being overweight and seen as more socially. Well, yeah. Well, if you're overweight, you're wealthy. If your child is plump, they're healthy. Yeah. First, thank you so much. It's been so interesting. Um, a few of us in the room went to a talk a few weeks ago uh, by someone who wrote the interim report um, for the Ebola crisis uh, for the WHO. Um, and her major argument was that global health systems and global humanitarian systems uh, are completely disconnected. And that was what led to kind of the poor and delayed response there. And I guess I would just be really interested in hearing your opinion on that kind of working on the, you know, working for WHO around human rights, especially in this kind of shifting power dynamic uh, post 2016, as you mentioned. Yeah. So, number one, I don't speak for the WHO. Please. <laughs> I don't. Uh, nothing I say is speak for WHO. I, I'm speaking purely in a personal capacity. Um, so, I think they're right in the disconnect between the world of humanitarian emergencies and the world of global health. And it's a conceptually unjustifiable separation. But the idea is that somehow humanitarian emergencies are emergencies and they have a whole different set of rules and people. And global health is the kind of long term, kind of we do population health and we do, you know non-communicable diseases and, and all these kinds of stuff. And humanitarian emergencies are sort of, you know, natural events. There are sort of epidemics, <coughs> there are sort of wars and all this stuff. Um, and I think that these two things have to come together and, and they don't necessarily come together for really silly reasons, which is funding. So governments and member states are more likely to say this money must go to this particular region because they have a particular interest in that region and they don't want that for, for whatever reason. As opposed to saying, look, the underlying poor health system is actually what's going to make it susceptible to the epidemic, which then you will then have to send in humanitarian aid to. But these two are two different concepts. Um, and so I think it's for me as an ethicist, it's also really interesting because the ethics of a normal situation and an ethics of a humanitarian emergency are seen to be two different kinds of ethics. 
and, and I'm not quite so sure that they are, but they allow people to make certain kinds of decisions that I would not necessarily find acceptable and stuff. So for example, in humanitarian emergencies, old people are completely disregarded because uh, the variety of people think that, oh, it should be the young that should be getting priority or the people that are immediately dying that should, should get priority. Is that what you... you yeah. Um, yeah, so you mentioned a little bit already about um, the kind of post-2016 era and how with recent changes around the world have shaken up the assumption that kind of global connecting this is the right thing to be doing. And I was wondering just kind of, are they, like, you know, within these uh, international bodies that regulate health and you know, humanitarian crisis and all that, um, are, there, are there actually kind of tangible changes or have you noticed, are you aware of Changes in the way that they're operating or the way that they're kind of the assumptions they're making? Yeah. No, they're very visible. I mean, I think that, um, um, so you know, just look at the biggest funders in the international health or global health arena, and you will see a significant <coughs> seismic shift. So, for example, the US government and its shift uh, in its now new rules and approaches. Uh, about what it will fund and what it will not fund. So, for example, uh, it's dr dr drastically affected the health programs that address sexual health in girls and women, or reproductive health in girls and women, what they can talk about, what they can't talk about, what they offer. And if you talk about that, then all of your funding for everything else also gets removed. So there's a lot of different stuff. And then as a result, other countries coming in and trying to make up for that, or people being put in very difficult positions. So, for example, if you're a women's health organization, you have to choose between do we, you know, risk everything by providing, you know, sort of abortion services to a few women, or do we provide, you know, reproductive health services for a larger number of women, right? So they're put in this position of having to make this sort of trade-off as a result of what's happened in the last few years. But I also think that <clears throat> this has affected um, so I gave a talk at the European Humanitarian Organization, it has a very odd name, sorry, I forget, no respect, no disrespect to <laughs> um, So essentially, with the US retreating in global health and humanitarian interventions, with UK retreating from the EU and stuff, the EU Humanitarian Organization has become the leading humanitarian organization in the world. And suddenly, uh, there's five famines, there's like three cyclones, and there's a bunch of wars happening. And um, it, ha it can't figure out what the right way to allocate resources or where it's going to go. And the politicians in the European Union or in Brussels have very particular priorities about where they think the humanitarian aid should go. And so the organization itself is completely, was, and uh, completely internally very tense priority over all five famines. And, and so that's a result of, of what's been happening over the last year. So it's a, it's a very significant impact um, in, in sort of day-to-day -day things, but also in these international organizations. And it has impact on uh, the distribution of disease. As you can see, we, we will see, and we are seeing how it's impacting health profiles of countries and, and, and global health as well. Thanks. Talk about some of the practical consequences, but in terms of the discussion, I mean, with the UN and to a lesser extent the WHO being organisations that are beholden to sovereignty and that are beholden to that stuff, do you think those are the places to really push forward the conversation on human rights, the conversation, or do you think that it's going to have to be external um, people and organisations to that that actually push this forward? Um. <coughs> So this is a, a debate that um, philosophers have with human rights lawyers quite a bit, <clears throat> in, in, and other people as well, because human rights in the law is law that, it, that it applies to governments, right? It, it is not 
It is what citizens can claim against their government in terms of its rights and duties. And, and so, in one level, human rights law is only about governments and citizens. And so, these international arenas are the only place that human rights happen. There's a whole other world which is all about human rights on daily practice, right? So, it's about empowerment, collective action, you know, how do you get a bunch of sex workers to realize that they have moral claims against their, you know, sort of communities or, you know, sort of how do they realize that they have certain kinds of rights and all this stuff. And that's one kind of stuff. But then there's also, you know, this whole work that we need to do about human rights is not just legal rights, but moral rights. So how do we get uh, international actors, as we can now call them, so companies that are transnational, philanthropists that are global, who are called super citizens, I don't know if you've heard this term, um, and how do you get them to start recognizing these borders about rights and obligations in terms of individuals and accountability and what you can and can't do. So we have a lot of work to be done. So there's a lot of work everywhere, really. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's much more of a, we have lots of different levels that we need to be working on just to get the basic concept that human beings are the center of what we care about and they have different kinds of moral claims. Excellent. I've stunned you into silence. Yeah. This is good. <clears throat> Yeah, that's all right. You don't have to come up with any more. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. It's been uh, it's been a great privilege. I hope you enjoy the rest of the series. I'm quite jealous that I'm not around to come and see you. Um, but give him give him a hard time. <laughs>